My message title today is The Power of Prayer and Praise. Everybody say prayer. Pray. Everybody say praise. I heard your voices, so we're going to be at the auditions. Yay! Oh. <laughs> That's what we're going to talk about today, the power of prayer and praise. We're going to look at a story about Paul in the Bible when he was in prison in a town called Philippi. While I was researching for the message and preparing for it, I came across a story about this guy called Louis Auguste. Louis Auguste, and he was born in 1875 in Martinique, an island of the Caribbean. And he was not a good guy. He used to get drunk a lot and fight a lot. Anybody else out there? No, only him. I'm only kidding. <laughs> he used to get into a lot of mischief and stuff. And one day, like normal, every weekend, he had a bit too much to drink and he got into a fight. So at this time, the police on the island were just a bit fed up with him. They decided they're not going to put him into the holding cell, which is what they would normally do. This time, they'll put him in solitary confinement, an underground cell with no windows. And now Martinique, an island in the Caribbean, is also the home of an active volcano called Mount Perry. And it exploded in 1902, erupted. The next morning, it blew up into the sky. A big cloud of uh, dust covered the land. Lava and this volcanic ash rolled down the mountain. Within minutes, destroyed everything. 30,000 people died that day. Almost everybody, except for one. Our friend Louis, who was still in prison, in solitary confinement, probably still getting over his hangover. He was there. Four days later, they found him, and they rescued him. The only man on the island to have survived that, uh, well, not, I can't say it's an apocalypse, but rather a real, really big event where a volcano killed 30,000 people. After he came out, he was actually pardoned for his crimes and actually became quite a celebrity. He went around the world telling people how he survived this horrific event and telling people how he, being in prison, became saved. And now in the same way, there's a story in the Bible about Paul and Silas in a prison in Philippi and them being in prison actually managed to save somebody else. So let's look at that. Let's turn to our Bibles in Acts 16 as we read the story of Paul and Silas in Philippi. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer had commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them into the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Have you ever seen that before? It's just wooden things, and they put your feet into it, so you can't get away. That's basically what it is, stocks. And then it says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flung open, and everybody's chains came loose. So let me give you a bit of context around what is happening here. Paul and Silas are busy on a missionary journey. They've already planted churches in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And now they've gone over the Aegean Sea to Greece, ancient Macedonia. And there they're in the city of Philippi. Philippi was actually named after Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedon. He was the, the king of Mas Macedonia. So they were there in Philippi, which is at that time a Roman colony. It's a Roman little town. And while Paul and them were there, they were expected to just go around pretty quietly and discreetly winning souls for Jesus, preaching the gospel without making any commotion. While they were there, there's a servant girl that starts to follow Paul and Silas around. And now it says very particularly that she had a spirit inside her that gave her the gift of fortune telling. So she had this familiar spirit, this demon, the spirit inside her that gave her a gift of fortune telling. She was a servant girl. She follows Paul and Silas around. And she starts screaming at the top of her lungs, these men are of God. They will tell you how to be saved. So everywhere they go, she follows them and shouts out, these men are of God. They will tell you how to be saved. And now technically that wasn't wrong or bad. They were of God and they were going to tell people how to be saved. But her motives were wrong. She was doing it to rather cause a scene that would cause them to go to prison and then hinder the progress of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you read about it, that's how sneaky the devil is. Do you know the devil doesn't jump out and say, Woo, I'm evil and wicked. We're all going to hell with me. He doesn't do that. Do you know what the devil does? He gets into the church and he presents truth right in with a whole lot of error. So you might actually hear ministers and Christians up behind the pulpit speaking about Jesus. It may not be the Jesus of the Bible. They might be quoting scripture, but if they don't know the Bible rightly divided, it's probably going to be in error. And that's how the devil gets to the Christians. He presents truth, but the motives 
are impure. So we've got to pray for the gift of discernment. When you hear people, even myself, even myself, question everything that ministers say and ask that the, that the Holy Spirit give you that gift of discernment so you can discern if that is biblical and true to the Word of God. Amen. We should pray for that. So this servant girl was going around and for days, and eventually Paul just got a bit fed up. And he turned to this woman and said, In the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. He's speaking to the Spirit. The Spirit left her, which is technically good because now she has a demon inside of her no more. She was a servant girl. She had owners, and her owners actually relied on their gift of fortune telling because they would make money off of her. So now that the spirit was gone, she could not tell fortunes. They could not make money. And I think we all know if you mess with a person's money, you're looking for trouble, right? So immediately they grab Paul and Silas to the magistrate's office. They said, these guys are making a commotion. They are preaching and teaching customs and practices that are foreign to us Romans here. The Romans believed in many gods. Myriad of gods. They believed in Jupiter, Neptune, all these gods. They also had something that's called the imperial cult. They believed that Caesar was God. They believed that Caesar was the Lord and Savior. Yeah, Paul and Silas were preaching that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior. Direct conflict with what they were teaching and practicing at that time. So the magistrate, without even a further ado, he orders that they are stripped, they are beaten, they are flogged or whipped, and put in prison. Do you think it's a bit harsh? At this point, they haven't done anything wrong. Nothing. They haven't caused a commotion. They haven't even said a word yet. They haven't uh, incited any riots or protests. Nothing. And yet, just because somebody else said what they had done, immediately the magistrate says that they were stripped, they were beaten. For me, if I was stripped, that would be enough. That would be enough pain for me. But beaten and flogged, whipped, and then put into jail, into this deep, dark dungeon. The Bible says they're in a cell. Not even with the other prisons. They were kept in like solitary confinement all by themselves. And the jailer was given instructions to watch over them carefully. So they were beaten, put into a jail, and in stocks. They were chained inside the jail cell. And you might think at that time, that must be pretty bad. Anybody been in that situation? No, you haven't. All right? Imagine being in that situation. Beaten, flogged, you're bleeding out. No one's looking after your wounds. You're not being fed. You don't have water. They throw you into this dirty dungeon. And there you are. You can imagine Paul and Silas being pretty discouraged in despair with a chip on their shoulder, thinking, oh, God, why is this happening to me? Woe is me. God, we just came here to do your work, and now look at us, we're in prison. Now how can we preach the gospel? That could have been their attitude, which is the attitude of many Christians when we get into trouble. But you know what they were doing? Let me read it to you. Acts 16.25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were what? Praying. And what? Singing. Hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. In their discouragement, in their despair, they started to pray and just sing praises to God. I don't know what prison you're in today. I don't know what darkness you find yourself in. I don't know what trouble you're in today. But I know that there's a God that wants to set you free. He loves you and wants you to be free. And it starts by you praying and praising. So let's look at our first one, pray. And for this one, I want to link. This story in Acts 16 up to one verse in James. James 5.13. James 5.13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them what? Pray. So the first part of James 5.13 says, if anybody's in trouble, pray. And now trouble here in this reference is to anything. It, it could be disappointment or betrayal. It could be persecution, hardship, trials. Any sort of pain, emotionally, psychologically, or physically, is trouble. And uh, let's be honest, I'm probably looking at a lot of people in this church that are probably in trouble in some way or the other. It may be January 2024, but you know what? Most of you carry the baggage of 2023 into 2024. Is that right? When you start January 1, nothing disappears. We kind of think that 1st of January 2024, all my problems are gone. No. If you had marriage problems in December, you probably still got those marriage problems today if you haven't sorted them out yet. If you had health issues last year, there's a good chance that you probably still have those health issues today. If you had money in December, I bet you, you don't have money today. <laughs> I bet you. You may have had money in December, but you got nothing now. We all get into trouble, whether self-inflicted or just life itself. You know, as a kid, you wouldn't say, but I got up to a lot of no good. I was up to mischief. I was very rebellious as a child. You wouldn't say it looking at this perfect specimen in front of you. But I was. And, and you know what? My mommy should come to me and say, Raymond, you're in trouble again. You know what I should tell her? 
Trouble is my middle name. Yeah, that's what I did. Anybody else that brave in front of your parents? Trouble is my middle name. My middle name's not trouble, it's Anthony. All right, Anthony's my middle name. And you know you're in trouble when your mom calls you by all your names. Now, I'm from, I'm from the old, uh, like, uh, I'm legend, all right, I'm old. So a lot of us in my family have lots of names, uh, first name, second name, third name, fourth. It goes all the way down to your surname. And I knew I was in trouble when my mom used to call out and say, Raymond Anthony Butler, you get your butt over here. And then, you know, it's all downhill. You know, that's it, you're going to get a beating. I was lucky, though. I never got hidings. Who got hidings from their parents? Uh, and I can see why. Counseling, people, counseling. I never got a hiding. And, and, and you know, I always, it, it bothered me for a little bit growing up because, you know, I knew my, my older brothers and sisters got hidings. But when I say older brothers and sisters, I'm from a family of 10. Okay, get up off your floor now, back onto the chair. I'm from a family of 10. I'm the last. But I'm not the runt of the litter. I'm the best of the litter. <laughs> I'm 10 out of 10. Yeah, I'm the last, 10 out of 10. Uh, back in those days, things were different. You know, it's not like today. My, my parents were Catholic, and there wasn't any TV. So it's easy to have a lot of kids, all right? <laughs> but you see, my older brothers and sisters, they got hidings. They got beaten up badly. They used to tell me the stories. But by the time it came to me, my mom and dad were just tired. They said, just do whatever you want. We don't really care, all right? They were just mook. We've beaten up everybody else. We don't have time to beat you. But I was blessed to, to not get hidings. But trouble, trouble will find us all. Uh, even today, you might be in this church and you may have some financial constraints. You're in a prison, a darkness, a place that you don't know if you can get out or not. Pray. You may have some health issues and the doctors are not giving you much hope, but you know there's a God that can heal. Pray. You may have those relationship issues. God can make them and restore them and make it better than it was before. Pray. The Bible says if you're in trouble, pray. Oftentimes it's people. We do this last. We kind of have the problem and then we go through all these things that we think we can work it out. And then at the end of the day we say, well, I might as well pray now. That's in reverse. We should be praying first. As soon as you hit the wall, you say, God, I have no idea. Can you please help me? Because no one else can help me. My family can't. My, my boss can't. My doctor's can't. But I know that you can, Lord. Pray. Pray is where it all starts. I uh, read a story about this lady that got a call. She was at work. She got a call from her daughter's school that said her daughter was sick, running a high fever. So she stopped her work. She left work, went towards the daughter's school. On the way there, she stopped at a pharmacy to get some medicine. On the way out of the store, though, she realized that she had locked her keys in the car. Been there, done that. Anybody else done that? Oh, you look like such a fool when that happens, doesn't it? She came out and her keys were locked in her car. And now she starts to panic. She's not frantic. She's got medicine. Her daughter's sick. What is she going to do? Then she remembered that she saw a movie when somebody took a coat hanger and actually opened up the car door with it. All right? So she ran around the parking lot looking for a coat hanger. And there she found one, a bent, broken coat hanger by the dustbin. She grabbed it, she came back to her car, now she had the coat hanger in hand, looking at the car, and she doesn't know what to do with it. Who knows what to do with the coat hanger? So she prays. She says, God, I don't know what to do with this, but can you please send me someone to help me? Just after she prayed that prayer, this big bike comes roaring in to the bay next to her, the park, the empty space next to her. This big guy gets off the bike. He's got long hair. He's got tattoos. He looks like really rough, like a hell's angel. He gets off the bike, and he can see she's a bit stressed and perplexed. And he says to her, lady, can I help you with something? She says, listen, man, I've, I've, I've locked my keys in the car. I've got the coat hanger, but I just don't know what to do. He takes the coat hanger. In under a minute, he unlocks and opens the door for her. She's so overwhelmed, she gives him this big hug. She says, thank you so much. You are such a nice man. He says, no, actually, lady, I'm not. I just got out of prison for car theft. <laughs> it doesn't stop there. She's still hugging this man. Tears are coming down her face. And she says, thank you, God, that you sent me a professional. 
I don't know what problems you have. I don't know what trouble you had. But right now, when you open your mouth and you start praying to God, it hits the throne room of God, and God hears you. He listens to you, and right now, God is sending you a professional. Sometimes we just got to open our eyes to it. Sometimes we think that when we pray, God must do things according to the way we want, when we want it. Sometimes God will send you a hell's angel to help you get out of that problem. It's time for us to be open-minded and open to God's miracles in our life. Today, God is sending you a professional. Amen. Amen. Let's look at our second point. It's called praise. Everyone say praise. Praise. Uh, Say it in the G note. I don't know what a G note is. (laughs) Warren knows what a G note is. Uh, We're going to continue to pick on that verse from James, James 5.13. James 5.13, one verse, and I know I don't take things out of context. I'm not that kind of a pastor. I like to give you the full story, but in this sense, this principle can be applied to anything. This one verse has two parts, an A and a B. The second part says this, if, is anyone happy, let them sing songs of praise. If anyone is happy, let them sing songs of praise. If you're in trouble, you pray. If you're happy, you sing praises. And it's oftentimes in troubled times that we run to God and we depend on him, but when we're happy, we don't really do that, do we? Because we're all right. Everything's happy. Marriage is good. The kids are good. Your health is good. You don't really need God. But let me tell you, it's in those times that we need to thank God for us being happy. There's always a reason to praise God. It's not only in the troubled times, but it's in the good times, the happy times. The problem with you and I, the problem with Christians, the reason we don't uh, praise or the reason we struggle to praise is because we're too busy complaining. Ladies, put down your hands. No, I'm only kidding. So all of us, we, as people, we love to complain. We always see the negative. We cannot see the good in anything. We'll look up and see clouds in the sky and say, whoa, it's going to rain. But we take for granted the fact that we can see those clouds. We should say, thank you, God, that I have eyes to see those clouds. But we're always complaining. We always come before God, and we get on our knees, and we tell God how big our problems are. You know what we should be doing? He's talking to your problems about how big your God is. Amen. Because he's big and he's powerful, bigger than those problems. We should change our perspective. There are things to be happy about today. I know that you're going through troubled times, but there's a lot of things in your life that you can be happy about, that you can be joyful about that right now in this church you can thank God for. Stop overlooking the happy times. I saw this cover of a book one. The title was 14,000 Reasons to be Happy. 14,000 reasons. If you be honest, you probably can only find 10, if you're lucky. There's a song that we apparently sing in the uh, song uh, Monique told me last week, is 10,000 Reasons. Have you ever heard of that song? 10,000 Reasons. It's also known as Bless the Lord of My Soul. It's It's one of my favorite songs. There's a part that says, for all your goodness, I will go on singing 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. For all your goodness, God, I will keep on praising, I will keep on worshiping, I'll keep on singing, because I can find 10,000 reasons to give you praise. Can you find 10,000 reasons to give God praise? Your life may not be perfect, but there's a lot of things in your life that you're taking for granted that you can smile about. You may not have the perfect husband and wife. My wife is lucky she's got the perfect husband. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I'm also imperfect. I'm like, you. Yeah, I've got issues. Not as much as you do, apparently, because I counsel some of you. But I've got issues. All right. <laughs> no, we're all imperfect people. My wife always tells me, you know, I, I'm, I'm a special kind of a person. I think you got that by now. You know, to know me is to love me. But to live with me, that's the other thing completely. My wife always says that if somebody kidnaps me, She'll pay the kidnappers to keep me because she doesn't want me back. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. If, if you're not perfect, then this is probably not the church for you, all right? And you probably won't find a church that will accept you neither because we're all imperfect people. You may not have the perfect husband or wife, but you know what? Your partner loves you and cares for you. There's a lot of people out there that don't have partners. Widows, widowers, divorcees, young adults that still haven't found love. There's a lot of lonely people out there. Each, each night they go to bed crying because they don't have a partner. They don't have someone to love and to hold and to hug and to kiss, but you do. Don't take them for granted. Be thankful. You may not have the perfect children. Maybe they're rebellious, get into mischief, maybe naughty. they a gift from God. They love you, you love them, and they bring you joy. There's a lot of people out there that don't have children. They can't have children. 
They'll give anything to have your naughty children. Don't take them for granted. Be thankful. You may not have the greatest job out there, but your, your employer pays you a salary every month to do the job you do. There's a lot of people out there today, right here in Paul Elizabeth, they don't have jobs. Be thankful. You may not have the perfect car, but you know what? That jalopy gets you from home and work and back. There's a lot of people I know that have to walk to work. Kilometers after kilometers, suburb after suburb. It takes some people three, four hours to walk to work and then walk back. You know how long that will take? By the time they get home, it's night time. They, they just wash their face, sleep, and then they've got to get up for work the next morning. Don't take it for granted. Be thankful. There's always something to be happy about. There's always something to smile about. No matter what your situation is, I want you to step away from the problem. I'm not making light of the problem. Don't get me wrong. I'm not making light of your situation. I'm just saying I want you to just step back from your problem and start looking at all the things in your life that God has given you that you can be thankful for. Part of that thankfulness is your praise, your praise and worship. We spoke about that. Warren spoke about it. Uh, when you praise God, you're thanking God. That, that's what it is. You're thanking God for who he is. And, you know, we have the worship team come up every Sunday morning. We sing these beautiful songs. I'm so thankful for the worship team. They've only been here a few months. I mean, I think it's five months, whatever. And they do such a great job. They, they come up here faithfully every week. They come and commit themselves to singing these songs. They come up every Sunday morning and deliver the best they can to lead you in worship. And you know what? While I'm playing guitar, I look around because I check you people out. <laughs> Checking. And I see some of you aren't singing. Yeah, put up your hand if you're not singing. No, come back. I check, and I'm looking around. I'm looking at who is not singing with us. And you might have your own reasons for that. I don't know, maybe you don't know the songs. That's legitimate. Maybe you're just not in the mood. I don't know. Maybe you think you don't have a good voice. So if you're singing, you're going to upset everybody else. Do you know what? If you're not singing in this church while we're singing, you're missing out on the biggest parts of worship. We need to start singing. And maybe you don't understand what the power there is in praise. Let me explain it the way I understand it. This is not biblical or St. Mark's thing. It's just what I, how I understand our praise. When you sing and you praise in God, your praise goes straight to the heart of God, to the throne room of God. Your praise is for an audience of one, always has been, always will be. So that's number one. Your praise goes straight to God. That's when you're singing, you're singing these songs to the heart of God, heart of God. At the same time, some of their praise comes back and hits you back in the spirit. Because when you sing in praises, you feel good too, don't you? I know I do. When I'm singing songs, I feel excited. I feel like the whole the spirit is just taking control of me. I just love it. I'm excited. I'm happy. I'm passionate. So that's the second part. That praise comes back and kind of hits you in your spirit and encourages you and uplifts you. But it's the third part. You singing your praises in church affects the people around you. I want to go back to that verse for Paul and Silas. It says at midnight... They were praying, singing songs to God. And then it adds on one part. It says, and the prisoners listened to them. Now, they didn't have to write that there. Luke, who wrote Acts, could have just left that off, but he put that there on purpose. You can just imagine that situation. Midnight, deadly silence in the prison cell. You can't even hear a pin drop. All of a sudden, from this deep, dark dungeon, you hear these voices of Paul and Silas. Just singing a song. A Hebrew song, a psalm, a hymn, I don't, I don't know what it was. They sang the song, and their song just resonated through their prison cell. You could have imagined one of the guys saying, hey, shut up back here, I'm trying to sleep. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says they listen. Those prisoners were affected by the praise, the songs that came from Paul and Silas. Now, I don't know what they were singing, but we could imagine it was maybe one of our hymns that we sing. Let's try one like, then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. You know that song? Let's see if you can sing it in the key of E G. Let's sing it with me. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Sing it again. Then sings my soul. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. Do you 
know what you've just done there? You've praised God in worship. And this is a song that most people know. So even if you're not familiar with our songs, you would have known that song. And I looked, and you know what? I could see everybody singing that song. So right now in that moment, you were singing those praises to God, and God heard you. Secondly, you were uplifted. Did anybody feel good while you were singing that song? Yeah, I know I did. You felt good. You just felt uplifted and encouraged just by singing, God, you're awesome. I love you. You're amazing. And I just want to say how great you are. But there was a third element. The people around you were affected too, weren't they? By you singing, I was affected. By solely singing, Angie was affected. Maybe in a bad way, but you... <laughs> solely auditions. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? So, but, but, but us singing... My son singing that affected the person next to him, and he was encouraged by him singing. That's what the power of praise is all about. It's when you open your mouth, it's not only to God, it's for yourself and for other people. So when you're in church, your praise and worship is very important. Firstly, to give God all the praise and glory. Secondly, for yourself. Thirdly, for the people around you. So next time when I look up, I'm going to see everybody Singing. Amen. That's the power of prayer. It's the power of praise. I'm going to read to you as we end off with the last part of the story, which I think is pertinent. It says that in Acts 16, 26 to 31, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once the prison doors flew open. Everyone's change came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword. He was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in and fell, uh, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out, out of the prison cell and he asked them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. I can imagine the jailer coming out of the clipboard, Paul, how can I be saved? He says, believe in Jesus. He writes Jesus down. He says, and what else, Paul? What about, uh, what about circumcision? I believe you guys do that. Paul says, well, you can. It's going to hurt a bit. I wouldn't recommend it. No, no, you don't, you don't need that. He says, all right, well, what about church membership? Well, that must be important, becoming a member of a church. He says, well, you can. It's very good to do that, but you don't, it doesn't save you. He says, what about tithes? Well, tithes must be important. He said, yeah, I'll give your money to the church. It's for the sustainability of the church, but it won't save you. He says, Paul, I don't understand, Paul. What must I do to be saved? Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved. You know, one of my idols is Billy Graham. I love Billy Graham. God rest his soul. And he used to preach beautiful messages. I just love his way of preaching, his style, his delivery. Absolutely perfect. And you know what? He got a lot of critics in his day, man. You know, a lot of Christians hated him. A lot of ministers stood against him. You know why? You know what the reason for the criticism was? His message was too simple. Why? Because he preached Jesus. They said, Billy, you can't preach that, man. You've got to preach that. You belong to a church. You have to be confirmed, baptized. You have to give your tithes. You have to go through this and this and this and this. And Billy said, listen, man, Acts 16 says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Acts 2 says, for by grace you say through faith that not of yourselves and not of works. It's a gift from God, lest any man should boast. We cannot boast in our salvation because Jesus did it for us. If you add in anything to the finished work of the cross of Christ, then you're probably not saved anyway because you are not trusting in him and he sacrificed 100%. There is nothing that you can do to save you. Save believing on Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. What a simple, beautiful gospel. And this story ended by that earthquake opening up those jail cells, a very particular earthquake because it opened up the jail cells and also broke their chains. And I thought that's a bit odd, isn't it? It's like very particular. It doesn't just like crash through. It breaks through and just opens the doors and the chains. And the guy runs in there and wants to kill himself because he thinks everyone's left. And Paul says, no, everybody's still here. Why do you think the prisoners were still there? Could it have something to do with Paul and Silas praying and praising? When those doors open and the chains were, their first thought should have been prison break. I'm out of here. But they didn't. They all stayed there. I think because of those prayers and praises of Paul and Silas, it affected those men. For some reason, the Holy Spirit convicted them, and they stayed where they are. Maybe to hear more from Paul. Maybe to hear the gospel of salvation. I don't know what prison you're in today. I don't know what area in your life you find yourself in. 
midnight, the darkness. Let me tell you, victory begins in the dark. Will you trust God in the dark? Will you praise Him in the dark, knowing that the sun is about to come up? Will you trust Him when things go bad? In the darkness, in the despair, in the discouragement of your prison today, will you start to pray and praise? I'll end with that same verse in James 5.13. If anyone is in trouble, let him pray. If anyone is happy, let him sing praises to God. Amen and amen. Let us sing our last song.